Hi, y'all. John Kelly here, and today I have a very special guest, Max Dashu, who is, I want to say, world renowned. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm making it real big, but I want to say a world renowned historian and also the founder of the Suppressed Archives. Uh, Suppressed Histories Archives. Sorry, Supp Suppressed Histories Archives since 1970. Welcome, Max Dashu. I'm really thank uh, you, Gina. Honored to have you on my uh, on my YouTube channel here. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think world renowned might be pushing it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just psychic. <laughs> All right, so I saw a presentation that you gave over at the the Goddess Temple of Irvine. You gave a presentation on your is it your newest book? Which yes, is it's, well, it's it's my one and only book. It's so your far. one and only book. Oh, okay. this is my first book, but it's volume seven in a series that's mostly written. So I'm now starting to crank the actual hard copy books out. Awesome. I look forward to that. I look forward to that. So tell our viewers a little bit about this project, what you're doing. Well, the whole project is called the Suppressed Histories Archives. And I made that plural because there's all these ways in which there's no one history. And some women would say, well, why don't you say history? And I say, well, I don't really want to get up the, give up the Greek word historia. You know, this has nothing to do with English, his story. And if women want to say history, I understand that. But anyway, you know, just multiple levels of uncovering global women's history. And so that is not just history. It's archaeology. It's oral tradition. It's art, literature. Uh, weaving, building, I mean, all these things that women have created and experienced, you know, the whole spectrum that we have been deprived of. You know, we don't really get to know that. We get this very narrow scope given to us. And when I began in 1970, it was card catalogs. There was no internet. And you're looking in the library and you look up women and you see housewife, uh, fashion, cooking, you know, you, you had this, you know, makeup. <laughs> and, and so it gave you this very narrow view. And in fact, the reality is so rich and so deep and so different than anything that even now that we've been shown more and more coming out. Yeah, definitely. That was one of the things that really struck me in your talk that you gave, how, um, women and specifically like wise women or witches had been associated with demons um, throughout history. That was purposeful. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, I found it really interesting because there are some witchcraft traditions that will claim um, like the devil or Satan as part of their like history that goes back. You know what I mean? Like the, the, right. <laughs> they are confused. <laughs> you know, this is a Christian construct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Satan the devil, this all comes out of, of Christian scriptures. And if you go back further, I mean, Satan actually comes out of the Hebrew scriptures and it means the adversary. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's really all superimposed. Right. And and so with the book, what the book specifically, this, this particular volume is really trying to look at what European, what the authentic cultural heritages of European women are before Christian, Christianity. And the period I'm dealing with Here's the book. I'll hold it up. <laughs> it's um, looking at a period between 700 and 1100 because that is sort of a, a break point where you still have pagan culture active. Mm -hmm. Still, the, the, the people, the various ethnic cultures are saturated in the old religions. Mm -hmm. Not one, but plural. But um, Christianization is proceeding and it's being really imposed from above mostly right and so that's the that, that's where the process of demonization that I was talking about in the in the presentation you saw yeah is is coming from because the church are saying the clergymen are saying the priesthood they're these goddesses that they worship are really the devil right you know and so when women lay an offering table with a plates and three knives for the fates who and then the, the little propaganda twist here the descendants of antiquity call the three sisters you know but who are really devils um you know for, for these three sisters that they're making offerings to don't you know that you're really making offerings to the devil so this is the bishop in germany talking to his people right and that is showing us 
that in that society, these ceremonies are going on a thousand years ago. Right. They're still talking to the, the three sisters of fate. That's awesome. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence, but up till now, it's been scattered here, there, and everywhere, mostly in Latin or in Old High German or in Norse, lang Old Norse language. And so my attempt is to pull together all these ripped shreds and strands and try to tie them back together and to see what they had in common between, say, you know, northern France with the Netherlands and with Denmark and with Iceland and with Ireland and, you know, just connecting up the cultural practices, the spiritual observances that were in all these places and show what they had in common and especially around women as spiritual leaders, mm -hmm. as seers and wise women and diviners and oracles, or as healers and herbalists and midwives, and then what that has to do in turn with the goddess veneration. Right. And all the layers of that goddess veneration. Right, definitely. Um, I, I'm particularly um, fo not focused, uh, <sighs> interested in when there are similarities across cultures. I'm a sociologist. So when there are similarities across cultures, um, those similarities oftentimes are like that human truth. So being able to see yes. that there's a history of exactly. women as witches and then like, what are those similarities? Because that is our, you know, our, our heritage as, as the witches coming up and into power now. Yeah. And we need to know about that. We're not going to do things the same way, but it helps us to have ground to stand on. Mm -hmm. It helps us even learning about some of the ways they did ceremony and the kinds of offerings they made or the fact that they used herbs to smudge, things like that, also are pointers to us because we're basically trying to reconstruct something that was destroyed. Right, exactly. And we really need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, I, I definitely agree. It was, um, as I watched your presentation, I was filled with this like um, great reverence for you and the work that you do. I have no patience for like uh, documenting history. Um, so I am deeply indebted to this because it is so necessary and needed when learning these old traditions or even just finding out who you are in this society to know that people like you, that um, people who understand this type of understanding that we have existed before and that they've been specifically suppressed throughout history, which is, I, I suppose, yeah. the name of <laughs> why you called it the suppressed histories archive um another interesting thing that you mentioned and i want to kind of bring that up was um that the the church as it was oppressing specific traditions was only using the latin and so would would not refer to the goddess's name at the time but would use a latin um goddess name to mean all the goddesses was that did i get catch that yeah right? yeah that that's something historians call interpretatio romana they insist on using a Roman worldview, uh -huh. which even, even Christianity as we know it is funneled through that Roman worldview in so many ways. I mean, it's not what Yeshua of Nazareth taught. It is what the Roman clergy made up, their canon law, their, their doctrines. Right. Okay? Uh -huh. And so when they're dealing, it's very ideological. When they're dealing with these pagan traditions, first they're calling it devil worship, but also sometimes if they're, they're really being forced to talk about goddesses because goddess veneration is what's going on, then they consider it a bad thing to use the actual names of the common people. And so interp the Roman interpretation insists that they have to give them Roman names. So they say Minerva or Diana instead of Hola or whatever the local name is. And a lot of times we don't know anymore what the local name is because they're all, always putting this latin boilerplate over everything yeah but a few places yeah they let it slip through <laughs> and and one of the areas where that happens is this bishop in germany bertrand of Wurm, that i was telling you about uh he uses diana and he also uses this biblical character in the christian bible herodias and oh. there's a whole story about how herodias dances to, for the head of John the Baptist, mm -hmm. her enemy. 
Her mother gets her to do this. They're both named Herodias, but she's also called Salome. And so this gets kind of, again, biblical authority is really important to these guys. It's got to be either Roman or biblical. And so they're using these two names, Diana and Herodias, and the women who go by night with the goddess. There's this whole mythology. And so the, the clergy are all scribbling this down, and they're pitching it to us in a particular way. The women who go by night with either Diana or Herodias, but in one place, Bertrand of Verm says, or the witch Holda, oh. the stupidity of antiquity called the witch Holda. Mm -hmm. So that links us up because the folklorists and the historians of Germanic culture are very familiar with a figure who is variously called Hola, Frau Holt, Holda, Hola. All these names mean the beneficial one, the oh. beneficial one. She is the kind one. She is the, you know, mm -hmm. and basically she's an earth and a nature goddess. Okay. You know, I, I started to say earth, but she also has the skies. She has the lakes. Mm -hmm. And so um, women are take witches are riding through the skies on the backs of animals, which is a really shamanic theme. And in the company of the goddess and innumerable spirits. And in a lot of the stories, it's the ancestors. So, you know, there's, there's all these interesting tie-ins. And so that one line from this penitential book by Burchard gives us a connection and we see, wow, there really is a through line between this text from about 1015 of our era. Mm -hmm. Connects up with things that were still being written about by the Grimm brothers in the 1800s, the early 1800s. All the folklorists in different parts. And if it's not Hola, then in Southern Germanic cultures, it's, it's Perchta. And there's these goddesses who are all an old goddess, a nature goddess, who is specifically a spinner connected with rituals of spinning and women's ceremonies around spinning and weaving. Mm -hmm. And who is, uh, babies are born coming out of Frau Hola's pond. And so there's this vast multitude of folk traditions and often folk ceremonies that are linked up with this goddess. And so this tells us something really important because this is not something that this clergyman just made up. It is something that really connects with living traditions in the cultures, which the common people never let go of. Right. You know, and and so that's really important because up till now, there's been this kind of headbutting. Here's the the academics saying there were no pagans. There were no goddesses. There was, you know, Europe was Christianized with the conversion of the kings in, you know, and there you could name any number of centuries, the sixth century, the eighth century, whatever, <laughs> depending on the country you're in. Right, all right. Then on the other side, you have the, the neo-pagans saying there were heathen customs, there were goddesses, there were these ceremonies. And But a lot of the discussion, and the reason I delved so deep into this arcane material, is because um, it's so theoretical. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is theoretical. Yes, there was. No, there wasn't. You know, And so I felt like what needed to be done was to really authenticate what I intuited and also things that I had found and kind of weave it all together and show how rich this web of culture was and how it had common themes running through it in these different European cultures. And, uh, you know, the theme of goddess veneration, of female seers and oracles, of the witch's wand, which in, in the book I talk a lot about how this has archaeologically been authenticated through, in Scandinavia, uh, the staff of the Vuller, which is the name there for the seeresses who had ecstatic trance ceremonies. And it turns out that not only are they described using these shamanic wands in their ceremonies, but archaeology shows me shows us that they were buried with them. And right. so we actually have examples surviving of these wands. And that, in turn, ties all things together, all the, the, the women's ceremonial leadership in these trance ceremonies, to, because they're in the shape of a distaff, a spinning wand, it in turn pulls us full circle back to the goddesses who are the three sisters of fate. 
and the stories about witches as spinners and the stories about fairy women and fates as spinners. So um, it's really interesting because the connections are all there in the material, but they've just been laying fallow and most people haven't been looking at them right. and going, oh, over here, over here, over here, this theme. And, and there are some folklorists who have been doing this, but historians in some cases behave like that doesn't matter. Oh, well, that's just, that's just folk orature. You know, that doesn't mm -hmm. really tell us anything about history. And so what is considered to be history right. is a whole question. In its, <laughs> you know, what counts as history? Does common people's experience and especially common women's lives count as being a central theme in history? Not until really recently. <laughs> right. You know, so... Awesome. Awesome work. Awesome. Just, I'm so looking forward to the, um, I keep coming up with the wrong words in my head, the unraveling. That's not what I mean. Well, the unraveling of the patriarchy, but <laughs> the, 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 yes. blooming of, <laughs> I'm like, why does unraveling keep coming into mind? Um, mm. but the blooming of all of these, these books and all of this knowledge coming to light because it is so severely not represented in the history that we learn. Um, and, and it's needed in our in our lives. <laughs> I like I like your metaphor of unraveling very much. You know, <laughs> it, exploding and all these other more military things. But the way culture works, I think the fiber metaphor, which is very much part of this book, with all this spinning and weaving going on, uh, you know, is really more attuned to the way culture works. Right. You know. <laughs> And then new connections are made. You right. know, it's very interesting because even words like text, which is so important in a lot of academic analysis, this text and inscribing texts on people's bodies and all this postmodern stuff, text is from a word that means weaving. Awesome. You know? Yeah. Just like like in, in, in India, both the Hindus and the Buddhists, the sutras, mm -hmm. that word means thread. I'm sorry, <laughs> what what means thread? Sutra. Sutra. The, the sutra means thread. Sutra means thread. Oh wow! You know, and 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 so and there's also something about the fibers of being. Right. You know, if you look at very shamanic cosmologies, this idea that you know there there are fibers and the fibers intertwine with other fibers, and so the luminous uh, matrix. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like a, <laughs> a, a a female way of looking at things. Yeah the um, luminous fibers actually you know this keeps coming up now and it's interesting because that's one of the main parts of the book right is that these um that the weavers are a primary aspect of a lot of these histories right um mm -hmm. and you were talking about the staffs being um having the symbolism in them of or not maybe not even symbolism maybe possibly literal tools for weaving both could have been both but definitely symbolically i mean this, i'm going to show i'm going to hold up a picture so people can see what we're talking about awesome. because when i first found i'm going to show you the first one i found here and this was found in um Ulen island in sweden sweden and i'm like looking at that clump near the top and going what is that <laughs> you know what it's a very particular shape and why is it there right and then I discovered last year, I was thinking I was finishing the book, and I ran across a source that showed that there were multiple staves in this shape. Here's another one from Denmark. Woman buried with this one. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're all in iron because the, the wooden staves mostly have dissolved into dust. Oh, okay. And with a few examples that were found in bogs. Mm -hmm. But you know, um, they, there would have been wooden ones as well. And so I'm looking at this and I'm going, well, what in the world is this shape? Here's another one from, this is Norwegian. Nicole oh, Boss. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so then I ran across, I was researching something else. And one of my sources referred to a Norwegian archaeologist who had proposed that these are in the shape of distaffs. Mm -hmm. So for those who don't know, when you're spinning, you have a, a staff that you wrap the raw fiber around and then you pull it off that staff down to your drop spindle and it it twists and it turns the spindle turns and it it causes you can draw out the thread so it's what the distaff became was a symbol of female authority 
and power. And, you know, we see it with goddesses, we see it with uh, fates, we see it with witches, and we see it here in the Norse case with priestesses. I'm trying to find an another image of the distaff, um, a woman with a distaff. Anyway, um, all right, so the distaff is sim the, the witch's wand, or in this case, the, the actual name for these shamanic women in Scandinavia was Vulur which means staff women. The staff is called Vulur, mm -hmm. which is called and Vulva, Vulva, actually singular. And so she was named for this staff. That's how important it was. And we don't really have a full description. It's like, were they waving the wand? Were they pointing it and using it to direct power? Were they shaking it? Because some of them have rattles on the bottom of them. Or... Were they uh, pounding them on the ground as a percussion instrument? There's, right. there's all kinds of possibilities. Or were they spinning on them? Right, right. Because there are references to spin, spinning as a magical act in the sagas. But oh, in any actually, that reminds me. So I'm spinning, I'm writing this down so I remember. I don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> so um, then this, this guy, Eldar Heda, discovered that they were in the shape of distaffs. And as soon as I read that, I immediately began doing a net search for distaff to see what they look like. And here was this whole spectrum of distaffs from Egypt and different parts of Europe that were exactly that shape. A staff that goes up and then it branches out into spokes that join again and then up again. And so that spoked area was where they wrapped the flax or the wool around it, was to hold it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I'm, my mind is just being blown because I have all these images of distaff shape um, staves and most of the archaeologists haven't twigged to this yet. They have not caught on and they're, they're talking about basket shaped handles and, you know, it's like, how could a woman's hand even fit around these, these really, you know, big diameter to the, to the things and, and nobody knows what they are. But this is the missing piece right. that Eldar Heda has come up with. And it ties together everything. It's the shamanic prophetic rites of Scandinavian women. It ties together the spinners of fate, not only in Northern Europe, but in the Mediterranean world with the moire of the Greeks and the parquet of the Romans, and even the fairy women in medieval legend in France and other places. Oh, cool. And women were laying offerings of unspun or spun thread at cave entrances in Portugal and other kinds of ceremonies for the fairy women hmm. mm -hmm. who are nature divinities. Right. And even this word fairy, yeah. our English word fairy, comes from French fay, which in turn comes from, there's various different versions of it, but ultimately it derives back to a Latin word which means to speak prophetically. Oh. And this is where fate, our word fate, comes from, from Latin fata. That's awesome. Okay. So I talk about this in the book, you know, just laying it out, because it's, there's some very complex linguistics, which you don't really have to follow. But I want to have it there. I mean, just reading about it gives us a little more of a depth perception of what is in this deep heritage. Right. In the way that language shifts in meaning. Right. Yeah. And and so like the fairies and the fates and the fatas, and there's different forms of that word. And then we have other words in other languages. So, because, you know, there tends to be a lot of emphasis in English sources to things that are Anglo-Saxon or maybe the French. Mm -hmm. The Slavic world, they also had three sisters of fate. And they called them the Sudice oh. or the Sudichki or Sudenici. And these are different Czech names, and it means the judges. Oh. So fate goddesses as the ultimate determinants of what happens, which is what the Norse said, even the gods are subject to the fates. And the Greeks say this as well. Yeah. You know, so you have this very profound idea of a female triune goddess who determines the nature of reality, determines the flow of events. And it's not really... Um, it's not really a deterministic thing. It's sort of like in the ceremonies, women are working with these energies. They're making their appeals to the fates. Right. 
And at one point, one of the bishops is saying to the women, foolish woman, don't you know that you are attributing to the devil the power of providence that only God can possess? And <laughs> the women whose voices we don't have anymore would have certainly been sitting there and saying back to the bishop, foolish priest, don't you know that we are calling on divine providence itself in the form of the three sisters? Right. But he cannot admit any female form for the divine. But this is something that still existed in the folk cultures all over Europe. Yeah, because they don't, I mean, even when, you know, people come in and take over the old traditions, they don't die out, like you were saying. <laughs> they still get practiced. It's really amazing. Like if you take, um, I mean, the, the, the party line in academia has been, well, you know, they, they very quickly converted and they're all Christians now. But... If you look at the Africans who were brought in slavery over into Brazil and into the Caribbean and into North America, you see a very strong holding on to old cultural forms. You know, Santeria in Cuba, they were forced to put a little Catholic saint cover story over their orishas, right. but they kept them. And they kept the drum patterns and the names and all of this stuff going, uh, the chants, the language going and uh it continued for more than 500 years and the same is true of the maya you know they've been catholicized but they have put their old deities under the rubric of catholic saints and so they've done syncretism they've right. mixed the hybrid religion right you know? and this is what happened also in europe but it took a long time and i think in europe the pressures were very great to the, the priesthood didn't want to have this fusion. They wanted their stories and they wanted the other stuff to go away. And the common people were saying, we're not having that. You right. know, they just continued inventing new cultural forms that pulled on these older ways. And they dreamed up new forms for it. But in, in many cases, in the case of Frau Holla, they kept the name of the goddess, they kept the stories about her, they kept her spinning rituals, and sometimes it would be a little influenced by Catholicism. For example, Frau Perchta, who is the queen of the winter nights and the spinning ceremonies, everybody has to finish spinning off their distaff before her holiday because she doesn't want to work on her holiday. And she's the one who oversees spinning. But uh, there, in order to observe her holiday, there were certain foods that had to be eaten. And some of these foods were fasting foods that uh, come out of Catholicism like dumplings and fish. Hmm. You know, they, they applied some of the elements of Catholic fasting culture to this older form of culture, you know, and so it, get, it gets all mixed up together. Right. Definitely. And um, the thing that I wrote down from, uh, that I wanted to remember to talk to you about, um, I remember I was at a, a ceremony with, um, I want to say they were, they were working with Dame Fate, so it would have been British traditional craft, I think. Um, and what one of the aspects of the ritual was, was that um, a woman who works with that goddess specifically was kind of up on an elevated um, panel and she was um, making thread. How do you say? Like, like on a spinner. Hi, um, uh -huh. you, know, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> I, don't, I can't spinning, think of the right? word. Yeah, spinning. She was spinning wool into thread, something like that. Okay, um, and as spin she, and yeah, and a spindle, thank you. So as she was doing that, she entered an altered state of consciousness and became the divine, like, uh, became the divine seer or prophet or representative of that goddess that you could then go talk to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just That's an oracular ceremony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so weaving. Also, spiders have been coming up a lot lately, and that's, you know, the archetype of weaving, <laughs> too. So. Well, yeah, and there's some very big connections there because, you know, this book is talking about Europe and most of the series, uh, my series, Secret History of the Witches, is talking about what happened in Europe in order to explain what then happens in other parts of the world because, of course, these ideologies get exported. But if you look at the spider grandmother in North America and particularly her, the form of her, well, actually all of them, she's a spinner, but the form of her in, in the Pueblo societies you know, she spins out her thought, and that's the creative force, yeah. you know. And we have other analogs to that in different parts of the world. There's in China, the goddess Si Wang Mu, who's kind of the great goddess of China, as much as there is one. Uh, 
she's the cosmic weaver. And there is in Western Africa and Mali, there are the, the numo, the, the seventh numo is a spinner. And there's all these metaphors of spinning in the, in the Dogon society, spinning, speech, the flow of water, the creative force. You know, and, and, and the, the speech part of it is really important, the creative word. And all of those are connected up together in Dogon cosmology. Oh, cool. Cool. Okay, so you mentioned the Secret Histories of Witches as a show. You have a show? Can we plug it? Oh, well, there's many shows, but uh, the, the, this is a series of books. A series so of books. So this book, which is my first book, is volume seven. Okay. I started sort of in the middle, uh, <laughs> as far as publishing goes. Okay. But the whole series is called Secret History of the Witches. Oh, okay. And it goes through vo many 15 volumes. Okay, all right. Mostly written. I just have to finish them and pour them out into book form. No, I so understand next, it. So next understand. volume will, will be on Greece, and it's called Pythias, Melissae, and Pharmakides, which are the Pythias, the Oracle of Delphi, the snake woman. Then mm -hmm. Melissae means bee priestesses. Oh. And so that's really important going back to Cretan times, and we see it also. Uh, that name is given to the priestesses of Demeter and Persephone, at Eleusis, so the Eleusinian mysteries are led by bee priestesses, and so are the those the priestesses at uh, of Artis, Artemis of Ephesia, mm -hmm. over on the coast of Turkey. You know, awesome. so this is a really old layer in Eastern Mediterranean culture. All and right. Pharmakis is a name in Greek that you know. Think about pharmacology, right? Yeah, or yeah. Pharma Herb woman yeah. is the original meaning, but it very quickly became a word for witches in general. Oh. And so Medea, for example, is mm -hmm. called Makis in, in the Greek stories. So that's three aspects of the priestesses and uh, the prophetesses and also the witches in Greek society. And I'm looking at the goddesses and the fates and a lot of the sexual politics runs through all of these volumes, really. But in the case of the Greeks, there's a lot of sexual politics. That's interesting. What happens to the goddesses? Because here's a society that's highly patriarchal, and yet they still have this female sphere of power, mm -hmm. which is priestess. And the goddess temples were run pr almost entirely by priestesses. And there's some exceptions, and that's partly the sexual politics, is men taking over those goddess temples. Right. But... Um, the, um, the then then in the mythology also there are stories in which the gods oppress the goddesses. You have Zeus oppressing Hera, not right. only cheating on her and not only raping all kinds of goddesses and women, but also at w in one of the stories he throws Hera up into the heavens and he attaches her to fetters, and you know he's he's punishing her for not obeying him because Hera originally was not. The wife of Zeus, she was the great goddess of the older pre-Indo-European societies yeah. before there were ever any Greeks known from. You know, this is old, old layers of culture. Right. And the earliest Greek temples that we know of were to Hera on the island of Samos. Oh. You know, that, that classical form of the Greek temple, mm -hmm. that's an example. Oh, all right. Yeah. So that, that, that's going to be volume two. And volume one is going to take a lot more work. So that'll be the megalithic cultures, what I call the elder kindreds. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. That's and then we go on to the Romans and then talk about what happened in Christianity and including Mary Magdalene, but also a lot of sexual politics in the church law and, you know, how a Jewish seer gets made into the dying god of the pagans. There's this whole switcheroo mm -hmm. where the pagan mysteries are overlaid onto uh, you know, a very a Jewish basis, but it's not any more a Jewish religion. I mean, mm -hmm. Christian not a Jewish religion. You right. know, it's uh, something else that's got this huge infusion of pagan themes, like the dying God, like the virgin who gives birth, which conceived by a God. Right. <laughs> Nothing about this in the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> And they take the word that there's a passage in Isaiah where it talks about a young woman shall conceive. Does not say a virgin. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay, but for the Christians and for the Greeks, it had to be a virgin. And so um, 
We, we need to analyze the history of Christianity in order to understand how things shifted and shifted again. Right. You know, so you have the rise of this Romanized religion and then how that in turn gets imposed over the entire Roman Empire. And right. then the race is on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I'm just um, floored. I'm uh, taking it all in. Max, you are an amazing um, resource and a, an amazing human to, to put this all together for us. Um, what else do you want to tell us about? <laughs> I don't have any other questions for you. So what do you, what okay, do you got Okay, okay. Well, you know, we, we could come back to Europe if you want, but I thought it would be good to mention, I mean, uh, there there is much more global focus in the Suppress Histories archives mm -hmm. than in these books. And one reason that I did choose to focus on Europe for this series is that because Europe, European conquest affected the entire planet and right. the forms of patriarchy in it, um, I felt like it was really important to account for what happened there in order to change the systems of domination that were the current systems of domination in the world. And so, um, you know, that is, I do get into the global focus later in the series because the Inquisition gets exported to Mexico and Peru and Colombia and the Puritans bring their Protestant form of witch hunting into Connecticut and Massachusetts and Virginia. And so you have all these dynamics going on. And, and uh, you know, it's very interesting to look at the combination of how patriarchy and racism, racial caste oppression are intertwined. Right. But, um, I want to just, I'll just hold this up. This is, um, let me see if I can get it without a reflection on it. I'll, I'll put a picture. Yeah. I'll get a this picture is, uh, and, and put it in the video. My my second DVD is a three-hour, two-disc opus <laughs> <laughs> that is called Woman Shaman, the Ancients. And this is this is really, really global. I worked real hard to try and get evidence from every part of the planet about female spiritual leadership in ancient times through archaeology. And so looking at rock art and ceramics and bronzes, and stone sculptures and codexes and paintings and whatever, you know, to try and see what was out there. Because I was, I became interested in, in shamanic studies in 1972, three, I guess it was 73. I happened to cross a book called Shamanism, which is one of the classics of the Eurocentric study of male centric study of shamanism. <laughs> this was by the comparative religion authority, Marseille Eliade. Mm -hmm. And he, his thesis was that shamanism had been invented by men. It was an entirely male sphere of power that only in its decadence was taken over by women. You know, that women kind of, made their way into it, but only when it was kind of falling apart and didn't really have its real juice anymore. <laughs> well, that was annoying. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, the thing was, I read the book because it had a lot of material that was important. Right. Material. You learned a lot about the Siberian and the Central Asian cosmologies, and he had different other things in there. But the problem was that his own evidence went against some of his theories. <laughs> He just continued to ignore, but you know, he was <laughs> forward. Like for example, in Chile, he, this is how I found out about the Machis in Chile. So the Mapuche people, the majority, the great majority of the, the shamans, which they call Machi, are female. Mm -hmm. And so I don't remember what excuse he had for that, but you know, it was all decadence. And basically in another theme, and this is not only him, but other theorists have said this too, is that male shamans command the spirits. But female shamans are spirit mediums, and they are dominated by the spirits. So it's all severely gendered, right. you know, all, of, all of this ideology. And it's also very much from a rational European right. uh, bias. Right, the system of domination that you were just making reference that has to right. do, like, that comes right. from this from the history of oppressing specific traditions, then yes. as those, those anthropologists who have been socialized into that worldview, then, uh, you know, ethnocentrically yeah. put it. Yeah, you're a sociologist, it. you know this. <laughs> this uh, you know, and, and it's really important because the socialization, you know, uh, the idea of anthropology as a science mm 
-hmm. when you're dealing with something that's so human, you know, human culture. And, you know, there are very, many, many examples of uh, Eurocentric bias, male bias, uh, even Christian bias, you know, just the idea that, uh, well, you know, there's somehow the, the idea of superstition or inferiority and, you know, cultural rel relativist uh, perspectives and anthropology have tried to repair this. We're not out of the woods yet, <laughs> you know, right, right. because, but I think that there's been a lot of move towards uh, for anthropologists to realize, you know what, you cannot stand here and pretend that you're above as if looking down on surveying what is below you, as right. if you have the ultimate interpretive power the real authorities on all these traditions are the people who are elders in those cultures right you know? and so that's the real source material but um anyhow in in the dvd what i was uh i had a certain amount of material because i'd done a, a slideshow for several decades called woman shaman and really just trying to pull whatever i could find together uh, especially from the living traditions about women who were spiritual leaders, but especially in this ecstatic form where drumming and incantation and sacred dance were very much a part of attaining a unified consciousness through which things can be known, healing can take place, spirit journeys can happen. And these are all elements, you know, which for lack of a better word, we've been calling shamanism because... Right. Guess what? Because of the witch hunts, we don't have words in English for all of this. Right. You know, so they have to borrow the terms. Shaman from Northern Asia, uh, taboo from the Pacific Islands, or mana, a word for inherent power, mm -hmm. that everything is infused with this vital force. Right. So, you know, those words still exist in some of the European languages. And I talk a little bit in Witches and Pagans about names for these in Norse and Anglo-Saxon, words that survived. But, um, you know, it's a worldview where everything has consciousness. It's a dreaming worldview where, you know, we have two halves of our brain, and one half is rational and linear and plans and designs things and, you know, does mathematics. And the other side, actually this helps a lot with mathematics too, <laughs> is the other side is perceiving at a non-rational level. And right. by non-rational, we can't judge that as being in some way inferior. Right. It is a great, a great perceptive power of the basic nature of reality. And in fact, if you look at scientists who, you know, like the double helix idea, mm -hmm. that achieved through a dream, you know. And there's a whole story there too about a woman scientist whose whose work was ripped off and everything. But um, and 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 Einstein also, you know, that there is a way that the non-rational mind solves problems that the linear mind could not grok. <laughs> you know, so I totally, I totally know. <laughs> you know, so that that's an important part of our being. And uh, do you know this this uh, neuroscientist Jill Bolta Taylor? Have is she heard? the one that had the? Um, I think so. She the, my yeah, stroke, stroke of insight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She had a little, literally had a stroke yeah. in the rational part of her brain. Right. And all that was left was the dream brain. But in the experience, she's like, because of the knowledge she has, she's, she's like, she did this synthesis for us because, you know, she actually got to experience in her own body right. the difference. And what happens when one part goes away? Because, right. you know, most of the time humans are, are operating out of that rational left brain. Right. You know? And right side of the body, left brain. And so, you know, she really, it's interesting to see how science, and this is true in physics and a lot of other fields, is coming back around to the truth of a much more multidimensional reality yeah. than the old materialistic, mechanistic form of European science that begins with Descartes, or maybe even earlier, the Greeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I definitely, I've been seeing that too, where like, um, a site, you know, there'll be a, a new paper or something that's published that I'm reading and I'm like, ah, they're coming back. They're like, you know, they're finding the stuff we knew back in the beginning. <laughs> and, like, and, and we and, need it, boy. Yeah. We need it because this, uh, this mechanism is really, um, mechanistic worldview and this, this consumerist applying the technological power to lowest common denominator, lowest common denominator consumerism is destroying the planet. Yeah, I would guess. I would definitely agree. 
<laughs> we, we need a little bit more of that dream, compassionate, uh, unified field right. vision. Right. About now. Yeah. And I mean, and, and right about now is when you're coming out with our histories, getting them published, putting that out into the world, the world of the consciousness and starting to bring it in and, and integrate that into their reality so they can evolve their consciousness and we can shift. It's happening. Well, let's do it. Yeah, we are, <laughs> I mean, right? We're doing all it. All along, I, I've been feeling like I'm racing the clock because I'm watching all this stuff going on and it's like taking so long to get this <laughs> finished. You know, it's like I've been working on this, writing this book for since 1978. Right. And what it was a book at that time, and what were chapters became volumes. Right. You know? so <laughs> right. It's like, it got a lot of control, but you know, I didn't really. Feel, I mean, I really didn't feel like I knew enough up until a certain point. You know, because I keep finding new things, and it changes the picture. It's very much a provisional process of uncovering and discovering and then oh this is wrong this whole thing I got from Robert Graves guess what that doesn't apply here this is there's this other information and sorting it and sifting it and then after a while all the material kind of falls into a pattern right it almost arranges itself because like like with the DVD I had uh I knew that there had to be chapters there's there's images of women like this well you can't see me but arms raised over let's see Way back. <laughs> Arms raised in invocation. Uh -huh. And I knew that that was a global pattern. I saw certain things like that. But the staff, the staff emerged on its own. And that was even before I found these, these archaeological staffs. I had one of them from Scandinavia. But they kept turning up in the rock art. And they kept turning up in other sources, you know. And it was like, okay, this is a global pattern of this shamanic staff, the staff of power, you know. And so the material itself was showing directions, you know, and they just sort of kind of took on flesh after a while. <laughs> right? <laughs> I get that. Um, also, back to the system of domination, right? Something that really struck me was that when you were talking about the suppressed histories archives, you were people were saying, well, what about, you know, I saw this thing, I wanted to take a picture, and you were like, take a picture and send it to me. Like, it's it's as if you're, as if the suppressed histories archives is a communal effort, and that in and of itself is different than the system of domination and the way that it's presenting material. Yeah. Well, you know, and it, it's just always growing, and it's just always gathering and more gathering to pull it all together, because we have, we're given such very narrow, condensed, very, very intense and condensed uh, topics and symbols and stories that are presented to us over and over and over and over again. So that, you know, like the Christian narrative or, you know, the aristocratic narrative of European, uh, even, even the idea of Europe being the product of, in history they show us, they start with the Egyptians and the Sumerians. And then they go to the Greeks, and then they go to the Romans, and then they go to France, and then they go to Britain, and then they go to the United States. And they never go back to Iraq, where, where the Sumerians were. And they never go back even to Greece, really. You don't really learn anything about what happened to Greece in the, uh, you know, the Turkish invasions or anything like that. You know, um, it's a narrative, it's a trajectory of domination. These were the important empires, and then these were, and, these, and that's all that's important. We're going to follow the dominators. And right. everybody else doesn't matter, right? You know, and so we're. This is the the society that we live in is still stuck in that. Yeah. So if you turn around, and this is for me at the very beginning, I dropped out of college in 1969, and because they wouldn't let me do this, <laughs> women's history was literally a joke, and so I wanted to find out if there were any societies on Earth because the our anthropologist told me no, there weren't where women were free. And they said, no, 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 all human societies have always been male dominated. Huh. And there are matrilineal societies, but it doesn't matter, they're still, made, they're still male dominated. And I'm like, matrilineal societies? What's that? I wanna <laughs> know about that, let's go look. You know? And so I just determined that it would make more sense for me to do independent research without having people standing over me telling me you know, you can't do this and, you know, um, grading me down because they didn't like what I was interested in. Right. So I just broke away. And so one of the really important directions 
for, I thought, I rationed, I reasoned this way, that uh, indigenous societies, many of them are not class-based. They don't have standing armies. They don't have empires. And so that might be a good place to look and to see if maybe women's status was better. Mm -hmm. Right. And that proved out not to be an absolutely true, but primarily true. Oh. Because, uh, you know, it's not like there aren't indigenous patriarchies. Right. But that that's a whole discussion in itself. Because <laughs> I see patriarchy as layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. It's a historical process. Right. You know? And so people don't come into the world as, you know, a male domination system. These are cultural systems that are built up over time. And they're kind of contagious. Right. You know? And and you can see how both women have been affected by these sort of viral patriarchies and how indigenous people have been affected by them too. Because once you gain a critical mass of a domination, then people start looking around, they're going, well, everybody's doing this now. I guess I will too. Right. You know, the, the, the submitting to it on some level becomes a requirement. Right, because right. The dominators. Right. With the, yeah, exactly. With the uh, an oppressive group that's like... That it's yeah infecting everybody like it's not that you find that you have a lot of access to groups that haven't been touched by western civilization at this point right exactly i mean the, you know the domination system is global right and, and then so and the anthropologists are, back then had the domination system when they were writing it down so, you know like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well you know because they were talking about savages yeah, right you know exactly. i mean if you read anthropology from the late 19 late late 19th century yeah they're using those words you know and angles and marks too bar savage savagery barbarism civilization right right uh, they might have had a more critical view of civilization than many of the theorists but you know and so uh, for women this is very problematic too i mean you can see the racialization that's going on with mm -hmm. those those interpretations of indigenous cultures but for women too because civilization the more civilized it becomes, the worse women have got it. Right. right. And, and there, there was a great feminist, Matilda Jocelyn Cage, who caught this. She, she noticed that in her Victorian society, uh, where she was fighting for women to have rights in the vote, that, that women were being told, you're so lucky you were born into a Christian civilization because women really have it bad in other parts of the world where they have not been Christianized. You know, they have it really, really rough. They are the drudges or they are this, that, and the other. And she began to see through that of what a what a card trick that was. Right. What a switcheroo <laughs> it was. Look over there. Look over there. You know, you've got it good. You should be afraid that it would be like the women have it in these other places. Right. But she had the advantage of having been born and raised in the upstate New York around the Six Nations of the Iroquois. Oh, okay. And she saw, wow, there's this other society, other, right? There's this society, and women have a lot of structural power in this culture. They are matrilineal. They are matrilocal. No man can become chief without being nominated by the council of female elders. And so they have a balance of powers between the sexes. Mm -hmm. And so she wrote quite a bit about that and, in fact, was made an honorary matron by the Mohawk Nation. Wow. And so here's your first example, not maybe not the very first, but at least in the, the first wave of an international feminist. Right, right. You know? <laughs> so she's saying because she was she was on the board with fight patriarchy. Right. She saw the harms of the Christian church as a patriarchal institution. She saw also the importance of priestesses and goddess veneration in history as a different way of doing things that was not what we had been told that it had always been male domination. She supported indigenous sovereignty and was, you know, a uh, activist for anti-slavery and for prisoners rights and for labor rights. So she had all bases covered. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Actually, and you brought the, the intersectional feminism is perfect because I had just written a note that I wanted to touch back on, um, you had mentioned this before, and I find it very profound and maybe something that people don't necessarily realize that the oppression of women goes hand in hand with the oppression of people of color. And I wanted you to hit on that a little bit more. 
Okay, yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot of ways that's true. And one really important way is if we look at prehistory, you know, and the early roots of patriarchy. One, I mean, there, there's a lot of things going on. One is property accumulation and the development of class systems and how women themselves become chattel. Right. You know, the way that marriage develops as patriarchal marriage and men wanting their sons to inherit their wealth and therefore wanting to control women's sexuality because how else are they going to know it's their own sons? Right. 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 So the sexual double standard arises and there's that whole piece. But a really important piece that is very much relevant to the development of racism is that warfare and conflict over resources, uh, this is something that you have even in Aboriginal societies, you do have that going on. And so in early warfare, women are taken captive. Men might be killed, but the, the captives are women. And women become a category who is regarded as potential chattel. The first early slavery, according to anthropologists, was female slavery. Hmm. It was not an imperial society that you could have plantation slavery. They weren't at that phase of super hyper organized systems mm -hmm. yet. And so sometimes warriors would grab women and bring them home. And those women were forced to have sex with them. You know, the rape was built into captivity. Mm -hmm. So female captives, the institution of taking female captives, degrades women's status across the board. And you can see examples in Homer where in the Iliad, uh, here's these women who are Trojan royalty. But when, when war happens, they can be seized and raped just like any other woman and enslaved. Mm -hmm. And so the, the way where I'm going with all of this is that the colonization of women's bodies for sex, for reproductive power. And this is the patrol lineage, right? The, the men want to have their sons and they have their sons take their name and their property. Uh, being able to brand them as their sons requires patriarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of this goes hand in hand with the othering because the early captives were others. Mm -hmm. They were the other tribe, the other clan, the other nationality, the other country, right? Oh, okay. And so this is how... Um, and even in it, as late as the European conquests of North America and of the Americas in general, and they begin seizing African people in the slave trade. Even at that point, they did not have the system entirely worked out. Um, but it, very quickly, it it begins to be boiled down to, wow, how convenient it is that we can identify someone by color, right, by their different ethnicity mm -hmm. as well automatically being a suspicious person if they're walking the street they could be a runaway the romans had to brand people and they sometimes put uh, collars iron collars around people saying run away or grab me i'm a runaway and that would because there if there was someone who had escaped before and been recaptured they were forced to wear these collars because they couldn't tell by looking at them necessarily mm. that they were of and they, they might not have been a, of an identifiably different ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the othering of other peoples is really at the root of a lot of the racism. It, there's, there's a way in which ethnicity functions as a categorizer. Right. And, right? and uh, the captivity is something that both women's oppression as women and indigenous peoples uh, or, or um, you know, the I mean, because really it was indigenous peoples who were enslaved mm -hmm. in the conquest, how that all boils down to become a basis for not only for enslavement, but for continual and continued subordination, right. subjugation as a racial caste. Yeah. Now, this is the, the thing that European conquest did to the world, because then ideologies, wow, I'm seeing low battery, your Mac will sleep soon. I'm going to have to pause here. And just pause. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. So uh, we were, I think we were ending on um, the connection between women's oppression and people of color's oppression uh, and their interconnectedness um, yes. throughout history. And also, I would say their interconnectedness in like um, 
who would benefit from the unraveling of patriarchy? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and there's another piece because, you know, again, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that all indigenous cultures are not patriarchal, mm -hmm. but there's also a matter of degrees of patriarchy. So, for example, West Africa was not free of patriarchal cultural structures before European conquest. There's a variation. I mean, some more so than others. But European conquest definitely degraded the status of African women. Right. Not only as Africans, but also because they still had female spheres of power in their cultures, right. you know, and bringing Christianity and the, some of the codes, the scriptural codes there about man being the Lord of woman and uh, the banning of priestesses, you know, I mean, right. new African syncretic religions arose in which women still, you know, this is true all over Africa. You still have female preachers in South Africa and a lot of other places. So they sometimes continued proceeding on their own cultural basis in these new contexts. But uh, English law, for example, was very severe, very harsh on women. And African women uh, didn't necessarily lose because they fought it. But, you know, there was an attempt to force them out of their economic sphere of power as traders. Mm -hmm. A lot of different cultural institutions that got pushed in a more patriarchal direction. And then you have, uh, you know, some collaboration by men who like these new right. rules, you right. know, and, and things shift in various ways so that you can measurably see changes that were not good for women. Right. Well, <laughs> we are, I think we are, <laughs> we're at about, we're at time, but um, I want anything else that you want to tell us. Um, I am open to it. And then also we're going to plug your, where to buy your book. Uh -huh. uh, how to um, visit your website suppresshistories.net um, mm -hmm. and any other any other ways that you want us to get in touch with you or um, to okay. support you on this on this journey. Sure. <laughs> well, one one thing you can do also is the Suppress Histories Archives site has a lot on it, and it is going to be overhauled, and I'm going to be adding a lot more material as soon as I figure out all this code new coding problems, but. Uh, the, there's a ton of material on the Suppress Histories page on Facebook. Oh, okay. Okay. And so we got 150,000 people following it now. Right. All over the world. And um, there's another page on Facebook about Witches and Pagans, the, the book. Mm -hmm. And hoping that people who order the book, and that's where you get it. It's not on Amazon. Don't even bother. Um, then um, that, that we could start having some conversations there on the Witches and Pagan, Pagans page about the book. All oh, right. You know, I think we need to have more cultural conversations and comments from people. And, you know, other, I'm sure others will bring forward information that they know. Right. And so that can, that can happen. And um, the website for the book is www.valetta.net. And that's V-E-L-E-D-A dot net. And so not only can you order the book there, but there is a lot of resources about it on there. And I'm going to be adding more. Like there's a glossary of terms and there's going to be um, a commentaries page, which I haven't put together yet. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I have to kind of get these net chops, these, these web authoring chops on, down for that. But um, there are some excerpts and the table of contents and the preface are all online. So if you want to look into it, you can get some tastes from the book without even buying it. Well, awesome. <laughs> Although you should buy the book. <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> well, you know, it's a source book. Mm -hmm. It's a source book. It's, it's um, not the kind of thing you would read through one night. Right. Because it's 408 pages. It has 140 pictures in it. <laughs> I think that the visual evidence is really important, but it's more that there's something to refer to, you know, because it covers a lot of topics. Right. And I know a lot of people are trying to research this for themselves and they want to know more. Like, I, I can't tell you how many women I've had come to me and say, well, I'm Latvian. What do you know about Latvian? What do you know about Sicily? And what do you know about all these places? And so the idea is to get what can be recovered out there mm -hmm. so that there's, you know, a chance to taste that and be enriched by it. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Max. I'm again indebted to you 
um, for the work that you've done is just phenomenal and uh, for being here with us, for joining us here on this channel. Thank uh, you very much for uh, inviting me. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs>